Indiana Governor Mike Pence was my first choice. I've admired the work he's done. And I accept your invitation to run and serve as Vice President of the United States of America. Here in TV land, we don't apply captions to archival footage like that. But if we did, the caption would read, in happier times. That was former President Trump introducing then Indiana Governor Mike Pence. Of course, Trump was not president then. He was the nominee of the Republican Party as his running mate. Of course, Mike Pence has not endorsed and will not endorse former President Trump's bid for re-election now. But, of course, the former president, as the presumptive Republican nominee, is tasked yet again with selecting a running mate. Several Republican options have been requested to provide documents. That's called a vetting process. The list is not limited to, but it includes South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, who both briefly challenged Trump for the nomination. I want to bring in our political panel, Ashley Etienne and Hogan Gidley. Join me now. Ashley, as you might remember, previously served as communications director for Vice President Kamala Harris. Hogan previously served as White House deputy press secretary in the Trump White House. Hogan, let me start with you. You to always start with me. I usually <laughs> do. To the degree you know anything about it, what would you say the state of the vice presidential search process is? In flux, mm -hmm. focused. I think that's usually how it goes. Um, it's obvious they have some names that they're looking at. I don't even know if that list is entirely complete. I learned a long time ago when working with Donald Trump to understand what we see in the press may not be exactly what's going on behind the scenes. And even when decisions are made, it doesn't mean they're actually made. Until he picks someone, I'm just going to kind of reserve judgment. <laughs> I'm happy to say I do believe most of these folks, if not all, would be extremely good vice presidential picks for a lot of different reasons. Tim Scott, of course, uh, my senator from the state of South Carolina. Uh, Burgum brings a lot of things to the table as well. Uh, no D.C. baggage, for example. A lot mm -hmm. of folks like that. A businessman. So, you know, uh, it's going to be a while, I think, until I have been pick. told that the former president, when he thinks about this and considers fitness to succeed him if something bad should happen, he refers to that regularly, believes a two-term governor is better positioned than someone who is a senator. You think that's true? I think so, and I think that's there's a reason that. That's why people see, think that Burgum's got kind of a, 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 a way not necessarily in, but is being given a serious look. Of course, and and it's there are very few senators that have been president of the United States. Barack Obama, of course, an exception there, but a lot of times we, and I guess Biden too, for that matter. But a lot of them come from the gubernatorial ranks because, as you know, states are kind of microcosms of the federal government. You are the chief executive of your state, and so the job itself and what it entails readies you as best you can be readied for being president. Ashley, it really doesn't matter for Democrats, does it? This is a Donald Trump election. Well, more importantly, I think the one thing that I just heard that I was unaware of is Donald Trump preparing not to complete a term if he becomes president. Like, that's the part no. that that's the part that, that just... No, he always says if the worst happens, meaning if something happens yeah, to I mean, him. You know, he is 80-some-odd years old and unhealthy and all that. But nevertheless, here's the thing. Usually when a presidential candidate picks a vice president, it's to shore up the person's negative, to expand the actual base. Here's sort of how I see it. I think, you know, that's why Donald Trump chose uh, Pence. But, but January 6th happened, and I think Trump learned a lesson on that day. Pence chose the nation over Donald Trump. I don't think Donald Trump's going to make that mistake again. I think who he chooses this time around is going to put Trump before anything else. Loyalty is the most important criteria by which I think he's going to select his vice presidential candidate. And if you look at all of all of these guys, they're all guys. They're all MAGA types. Stefanik's on there. There's oh, excuse a me, a woman, yes. yes. At least Stefanik, member of yes, the House Republican right. leadership. All MAGA types, MAGA Republicans who would put their loyalty to Donald Trump before that of the country. That is a concern, but I think that's that's how Donald Trump's going to choose. He's going to he's not going to make the mistake that he made last time. He's not going to choose anyone who's not going to put him before the country. So that's but but I will say I think you're right. I think the best candidate on that list is Tim Scott and I'll say why because Tim Scott is going to be loyal. He is a MAGA Republican, but more importantly, he would expand his base. I think he can pick up some black voters. Hogan, as you well know, there is this sidecar conversation among Republican donors who like Nikki Haley, who supported Nikki Haley, to try to get her back in the conversation. And many of those donors who were on the sidelines are coming back into the Trump orbit, perhaps with that goal in mind, <clears throat> among many others. 
How would you assess Nikki Haley's prospects? Well, again, we knowing went from, that we, conversation we, is yes, real. Yes, of course. And we went from a South Carolina senator to Nikki Haley, who was my governor. So I'm well aware of, of her attributes and her abilities. Um, I think in most elections, as we would probably both agree, the vice presidential pick doesn't mean much because it's a top of the ticket election. This one's different. You're talking about Joe Biden that no one believes is going to finish the second term. And so Kamala I Harris, you will. Kamala, well, you're the one. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Uh, Kamala Harris will most assuredly become president in the second term uh, uh, under Joe Biden. So the VP pick does matter here. The Nikki Haley piece is interesting because it, if I'm reading the tea leaves right and the people I talk to inside the campaign are being honest with me and I have no reason to think they aren't, you also want someone who's going to continue the America first agenda, the make America great again mantra. Nikki Haley does not do that, and she does not shore up or excite your base, which you are going to need mm -hmm. in this election. She might create as many base problems as she uh, does att attract, yes, yes pop, if not more, marginally attached Republicans, if not more. They want to move away from the globalist, corporatist uh, so wing of the party, and that's her, her position, that's her part in the party. So many don't want to go back to that, and I'm afraid it would really depress turnout from the base. I mean, poor Nikki Haley, she got nothing for compromising her values. I mean, I'm sorry to say that, like, no disrespect to the governor, You're, but she, you know, supported Donald Trump and got nothing out of that deal. Actually, the Washington Post wrote a column, or carried a column this week that said, black voters in America don't like either of their options, and that is more of a problem for President Biden than it is for former President Trump. Um, yes, so there was that article. I think one thing we should do, and I've been thinking about this for some time, I think it's important to consider um, the world in which voters are living in and how they're processing the world. Many of these voters voted for the first time for president. They voted for Barack Obama, and they saw how Barack Obama was treated. I mean, the Republicans, you know, burned him at the stake for not wearing a lapel pin, for wearing a tan suit, for putting his foot up on the Resolute desk. Meanwhile, they're saying nothing as Donald Trump contrived an elaborated scheme to overturn the election and uh, incite an insurrection on January 6th. So these, so folks are, those voters are processing that new world. And I think overall, they're just feeling less hopeful and optimistic about their own stakes. And then the other thing I would add to that is you got the Supreme Court overturning affirmative action. I think from a lot of different vantage points, that voting block is feeling like they're under siege. And the problem for the president is he needs to listen more. Yep. And secondly, he needs to find a way to inspire them. They're not inspired to come out and vote. Ashley, you get the last word. Ashley, at the end, Hogan Gidley, thanks so very much for your time.